true crime reporter goes inside the yellow crime scene tape. I'm investigative reporter Robert Riggs with decorated former federal prosecutor Bill Johnston. You can follow our journey into darkness and get bonus episodes by joining our true crime community at truecrimereporter.com. Our true crime cases are stranger than fiction. With that said, here's a classic police procedural, a true crime reporter confidential. There are stories that we journalists cover that stay with us forever. Certainly one that has haunted me for 30 years is the case of serial killer Kenneth McDuff. And I know it's haunted my co-host Bill Johnston, the former federal prosecutor who launched the manhunt for McDuff and then later prosecuted the parole board chairman for corruption who let McDuff out of prison early. And we have another reporter former television news reporter Rebecca Rodriguez, who has been deeply affected by her coverage uh, of McDuff. Rebecca, take us back to when you first started covering the case of a young woman who suddenly just disappears in Austin a few days after Christmas in December 1991. So that's when I was uh, working as an anchor and reporter uh, at the ABC station in Austin. And, um, you know, really it was, it was a shocking disappearance, you know, because it seemed to happen in a, what would one would consider a relatively safe environment. Um, it was a Sunday evening. I remember it so clearly. It was a Sunday evening. She was washing her car and, um, vanished. Um, it was, you know, off of fifth street, fifth street, which was in a residential area, not too far from sixth street, but not in that entertainment area, uh, further west of it. Um, and so, you know, at first it was a missing persons, obviously a great concern to everybody. Her, uh, fiance at the time, uh, was, you know, very much at the forefront of that search, uh, as was her family. And, you know, it was just a, it was kind of a shocking thing, uh, you know, really to, to imagine happening to a woman who seemed to feel very comfortable in her environment, washing her car. For f- people that know Austin, Texas today as this thriving Tech driven, amazing, yeah. you know, really large city now. What was it like in terms of the, for lack of a better term, the innocence of Austin and Austin, Texas in those days? You know, we've talked about that a little bit too. It, it, it changed so quickly, really. I mean, um, I, I'd gone to school uh, in the area. And so I'd spent a number of years there and had seen things changing from the late 80s to the early 90s. And certainly it began to feel like a bigger city. But by comparison, when you look at Austin today, um, it was so different. You did feel comfortable. You felt safe taking that evening jog. You felt like you could leave your home, your apartment, and go for a run, and you'd be fine. Um, You know, you could go run at Camp Mabry at night and felt safe. I mean, there was just a level of comfort and safety that I think many individuals and certainly women felt um, in being able to just sort of move about at, mm-hmm. at, their, at their leisure. And certainly washing one's car is something that I had done that. Um, I, would have, I would have never thought twice. Well, it was really laid back then. And, you know, there were bumper stickers that said, keep Austin weird. <laughs> they may still be there today. But what then, when this happens, what are you and your girlfriends? What's your reaction? What happens across the city? Well, you know, I think folks began looking over their shoulder. Um, And I will tell you, to this day, I'm not comfortable washing my car alone. Uh, That sounds maybe like an overreaction to something. But, you know, I don't do it uh, without making sure that I feel safe in my surroundings, looking to see who's in the other bays. I mean, it's one of those things that it was so abrupt. It happened so quickly and suddenly. And she was taken physically taken uh, and carried away in a manner in which she could not fight back that it made me feel as though any woman could be that helpless. And we know now, of course, and knew not terribly long after the events from the accomplices confession that McDuff um, 
like a shark swimming around a, a bait fish, went around the car wash. He saw her. Um, he parked, I guess, left his car running, parked right next door, next, next to the bay, and then grabbed her by the throat. And as you said, in McDuff's, we know that McDuff's victims were often rather petite uh, women. And he was 6'4", huge hands. And he, of course, bragged that it was like grabbing a chicken by the neck. Um, but I think in, in what you said, the, the horror, for lack of a better term, or the terror of vanishing mm -hmm. in the night, vanishing, soap still dripping down her car. I, I think that's part of the, the shock that Austin felt. And, you know, I prosecuted uh, in federal court in Austin some in that time. Violent crime was pretty rare in Austin. Violent crime against strangers was very rare right. yeah. in that day. Their keys are in the ignition, <clears throat> purse on the seat. I mean, it, and I still remember the suds rolling down the side of the car mm. still there. And she's gone. No hint, nothing. What, what struck me, and, you know, you talk about what we learned later from his accomplice, um, was her yelling and screaming, mm. not me. Mm. Not me, not me. I mean, she knew, she knew exactly mm -hmm. how it was going to end and um, immediately knew she had been chosen mm. um, by a predator. And I remember later, and there were two capital murder trials, uh, and I remember the, the women reporting, it really hit y'all hard that not me, not me, of putting yourself in that situation. Those words, Robert, I think in particular because, you know, growing up, you have parents that caution you, you know, it, it could happen to you. It can happen to anybody. I mean, it can happen to anybody. Mm. Don't let your guard down. Be careful as a parent. You know, I've cautioned my daughters uh, in the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to be careful. Don't let your guard down. Um, nothing's going to happen. Well, you don't know that is, I think, what every parent says in response to that. You don't you don't know that. Um, and that kind of was that worst case scenario, that worst fear realized. Mm. She, um, she was, uh, we now know even the backstory about why she was washing her car. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you've heard that, but. Um, and she, I should say she is 29 year old Colleen Reed, who was an accountant. Yes, Colleen. Very petite. Yes. I mean, uh, and loved by everybody. And, you know, just before she was abducted, she'd been out doing charitable work. J just um, horrifying. And when we learned um, a few months later the details of what happened with her, um, I know several of us in law enforcement, prosecutors and detectives and police, U.S. Marshals and others, uh, we were surprisingly, indescribably torn up by it. All of us pretty much had daughters, or uh, you don't even have to have a daughter to get that. <laughs> no. But it, it, the, the details, you can't get away from them. We haven't yet, and to this day, none of us have. And it was two months later that up the interstate north of Austin, about an hour's drive in Waco, he abducted a um, young, pregnant convenience store clerk who had two children in the dead of night, and uh, she vanished, and everybody was stunned. Now, later, uh, after the manhunt, which Bill initiated and became a nationwide manhunt with U.S. Marshals, um, he was tried for capital murder. He was charged with capital murder for her, Melissa Northrup, and also for Colleen Reed, a different case. But you covered the first trial, which was held in Houston, away from Waco on a change of venue because of all the publicity. What was it like when you first saw him in person, knowing what all he had done to his victim? You know, well, there had been a tremendous, as you just described, amount of interest, you know, in the crime, in the disappearance of the, you know, Colleen Reed from Austin, who could have been anyone's best friend or sister or it could have been me you know that that was the that was the way i think so many people mm. felt 
uh, hearing about that crime. And there was a huge level of interest in in seeing uh, justice in this instance. Um, and so, you know, that's what we were prepared to cover. And you try to disassociate, obviously, from the individual that you're covering, uh, because that's the job of a reporter, to be objective and, and start each day with that that perspective. Um, and I remember, and just to be quite honest, I was struck by how tall he was. I was struck by his size. This, you know, man who just kind of lumbered across the street. And I think, you know, the way I would describe it, he was someone who moved with no grace. Never thought about that. That's I right. Neither. And it was just, you know, uh, one foot in front of the other and just almost too too large to manage his own movements but obviously to use his hands as, as weapons was not an issue for him i thought of him uh as an animal and um the best uh, sort of a human animal um th- his eyes uh we'll talk about that in a minute your perception of him i you know been within a couple of feet of him many times and the, his eyes were dead they were dead and his physical appearance i never thought of it until you said that he Almost like he's a machine mm-hmm. moving forward as opposed to someone with some grace or some intent. Um, but there's, there was something missing, a spark of humanity missing in him. Um, how did he behave in court? And then how did that, when, when the details of the confession came out, how did you absorb that? You know, watching him walk across the street, of course, <clears throat> as a reporter, you know, we're forced, uh, we're put in that position to to engage, you know, and, and you want to uh, talk to the individual. And so you, you are looking for that bit of humanity with which to engage. Um, you're trying to make eye contact. You're, you're trying to, you know, get someone's attention um, to ask a question. Uh, you're right, Bill. He, he did not have that sense of someone who you know, had any curiosity about the world about him, wanted to know anything about this or that. I mean, he was motivated by something that was really unknowable. Hmm. My goodness. So, um, and you were out there too. When he would be brought to the court in, in, in Houston, we would uh, roll video, and I would often be asked, asked questions just to see if he'd say anything. Would he respond? No. No, not really. Just a, kind of a... <clears throat> sneer Mm -hmm. at you and stuff. And we do the same when he would come out. But the thing that struck me, and I was as close to him as I am here to you, Bill, about, you know, two feet, three feet. It was amazing how close we could get get. Uh, There was nothing in the eyes. They were just this, this, they were, I described his eyes like a shark. And I remember the marshals and all were like, well, you got that right. Mm. They were just, you know, if his eyes are a window on the soul, I didn't see anything. Never saw anything. No. No, there was never any reaction, um, you know, to the crowd. It was almost a circus-like, you know, oh, atmosphere yeah. Yeah. because there was attention. There was attention from several, certainly all the stations in Houston. There was a, there were all the stations from Austin. Mm-hmm. There were network correspondents there as well. Dallas had sent, you know, reporters, and so there was there was a circus atmosphere in terms of what the media can generate in and of its 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 own uh, energy. You know, crossing the street. Every morning, you know, photographers backpedaling to try to get the shots. Um, and he just kind of would glance around, making his way through it. And people mm-hmm. would shout out questions. And I remember him mumbling. But I don't, I don't remember really anything that we could use ever. You know, mm-hmm. there was never any quote unquote sound or there were no quotes that I think that we could ever discern. I do remember I got one reaction from him and it was after he got the death penalty. And they're bringing him out. And Melissa Northup's brother had positioned himself there. He just wanted to see him, just wanted to take a look at him. And I was pretty much there alone. I don't know what had happened. I think everybody was was in there talking to families. And he's coming. He's right on me. And I go, well, Kenneth. And I did it kind of with a, you know, attitude. I said, well, Kenneth, what now? And he pauses and he turned and looked me right in the eye, right in the eye. And he just kind of get this snarling, sneering. And he goes, well, I guess I'm going to die. But, you know, we all have to sometime. Hmm. 
And I really read that at the moment is that, but I'm the one who always controls the moment of death. That's what I did on my right. victims. <laughs> right. Mm. Yeah. In court, uh, and what's what unusual about this case is that he had uh, an accomplice. Uh, and uh, so we really get a spectator's view, and although he also participated, of what a sadistic sexual serial killer actually does. We really never had that before in a case. I you know, I knew one of the FBI profilers. We had never had that what they do. You knew the result, but you didn't know. Yeah, you knew the result. Sort of the play-by-play action of what they do. Yeah, and so we found out it was hours of torturing his victim. You know, it was all unthinkable. It was just unthinkable. It wasn't just raping them in every manner conceivable. It was torture. And he he, uh, really got excited from their fear and their suffering. That's what, you know, but when you heard that confession in court, Red, what what went through your mind? What went through my mind was the fact that the, that information was becoming public information. And whether his, his victim's family was in the room or outside the courtroom, it was out there. And they were going to be tortured again. Mm-hmm. He had another tier of victims. These were people who had already suffered immeasurably. They had lost Melissa. They had lost the daughter, the mother, you know, the wife. They had lost everything in that. And then to have to be subjected to the knowledge of, of how the torture occurred, whether they heard it in the moment or, or later or sometime down the road, um, I thought was, was just a level of cruelty that um, I had a difficult time reconciling. I don't know that I didn't feel personally uh, i find that kind of information offensive i don't seek out horror movies i don't mm-hmm, seek out mm-hmm. that type of literature i don't seek out those details about things i just i i don't enjoy uh hearing that type of of information as a reporter there was an obligation to to share it i i felt it was my responsibility to to share what was necessary to create the idea in the viewer's head of what had occurred without going into the kind of disrespectful detail yes that would be offensive to her friends and family that might be listening and so that's what i felt mm. um and again i guess that goes hand in hand with being a little bit uh, you know disassociating myself from oh this is a person who's who's just committed multiple murders and i'm you know three feet away i always saw myself as a reporter with a job i was the vehicle for the information it's interesting you you say that you don't seek out that sort of thing. Robert and I have had discussions not too long ago about true crime shows and how some of them get a little giggly um, where they think something's cute about it or they think something's um, not interesting, but, um, well, it, it, it's almost humorous. And when you have been as close as you were to the words and the effect on the family, the effect on the jury. And similarly, when I've heard, you know, the accomplice confess the night he confessed, um, there's nothing cute or funny. There's nothing clever. It's just horror and sadness. And, and you had such a hard job. I know as did Robert in that day, because you do, you want to communicate to the world, this is a horrible person and here's what we believe he's done without giving such detail that it in some fashion makes a carnival of it. And uh, I, I don't know how you guys do that. You did it better then than sometimes it's done today. I think we pull the veneer completely off sometimes and some of that's too heavy. Yeah, no, no, no doubt. I mean, there, there's a constant uh, filtering, uh, I think, whenever you are in that kind of a situation. Um, this person was almost um, over the top in terms of what you would see, uh, I think, on, you know, on the pages of some horror novel <laughs> or some film. I mean, it really was a, hor- a horrific uh, character come to life in yes. so many ways. And, you know, 
to realize that he was walking amongst us. Well, you I, know, I think the opening and the prosecutor in Houston was like, he's the monster that comes in the night on Halloween that you've never imagined could exist. And I'd remember the marshals shared the confession with me right after he was captured in their office. And I thought I'd covered a lot of stuff and been in war zones. And I was speechless, sick when I left. I will say this though. It fired me up. I was like, boy, I didn't, I wasn't disassociating myself then. It was like, wow, yeah. I've got to find out really to find out how he got out of prison. After, yeah. after the accomplice gave a confession and it was mostly correct. We think, mm-hmm. um, we were at the, in Belton, Texas, in the Bell County, uh, sheriff's office. We immediately took him, the accomplice <clears throat> to where he described where these things took place. And that was north of, Belton on a road that parallels Interstate 35. And we spent several hours with him trying to get him to point out, to help us in some fashion find. And we looked for her thinking it was not going to be tough. And, um, but we now had a spot geographically where he said these things took place for years until today, actually. Anytime I go the back way to Austin, or the back way to Belton, Texas, and I passed down that road, I know where that, I know where it was, where, uh, where this, uh, the last moments that this guy witnessed, at least, his accomplice witness took place. I look away. Um, you know, it was um, where this part happened, not where she was ultimately buried, but where this part happened, this end of this torture took place, apparently, or some of the, the last part of it. It was, it was so close to Macduff's parents' house mm-hmm. that had she screamed, most likely the only humans that could have heard it were Macduff's parents. It was the closest house. And uh, that has so etched me geographically that I don't like going by there. And if I do, I don't look down that way because I start, uh, I start hearing the confession again. And, uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's too much. It's too much for one human to think that another one has done that to someone, particularly a young lady like that. And that's not unlike, um, you know, I know the uh, convenience store where Melissa Northrup was abducted was on New Road. New Road, Interstate yeah. 35. In Waco, and Texas. so it's the same thing. I, I uh, see the New Road exit and I think about Macduff. I, I see... Uh, you know, do it yourself car wash with mm. st- open stalls yeah, like yeah. the one on Fifth in Austin. And I think about Macduff. This is all these years later. Yes. You know, and my connection to this crime was, was so periphery in terms of, of that of, you know, just being a reporter covering it, albeit, you know, intensely and <laughs> for a number of months, really. Um, but it was nothing compared to what the people who were touched by the crime as family and friends were, yes. would have been. But it just speaks to the horror and the depravity that we are aware of. Um, and, you know, for 30 years, tried to figure out, was there a good in this? Hmm. Uh, I don't know. Well, let's come back in a moment and talk about this. Let's pause. We're talking with veteran television reporter Rebecca Rodriguez, who covered the trial of Kenneth McDuff, the capital murder trial, and also covered the disappearance of, uh, of one of his victims in Austin, Texas. You know, we were talking earlier that the victim from Austin, uh, you know, he killed her with an earshot of his parents' home. And... Everybody along the way here encountered Addie McDuff, his mother, known as the pistol packing mama, who was like the the stereotypical mother of a serial killer. Uh, McDuff writes you after the trial. Everybody had sent in a request to be interviewed, but he writes you. He singles you out, and then his mother contacts you. Tell us about that. So as, as you mentioned, you know, it's kind of a matter of course. As a reporter, you know, you, uh, the cursory request for an interview. 
uh, to get, you know, the uh, perpetrator, uh, you know, side of a story. And uh, almost always, you know, it's ignored, A, or B, you get a response from uh, an attorney's office saying thanks, but no thanks. Um, I don't remember any time before then or after then getting a handwritten letter from someone, uh, and certainly not someone, you know, uh, on trial for, for death, you know, potentially going to death row, capital murder trial, <clears throat> who was asking or rather explaining why <clears throat> they could not do an interview. Um, but I remember being just kind of startled by the, uh, by the envelope when I saw it. You know, it arrives in the newsroom and it's, it's placed on my desk and it's his handwritten manuscript and a very neat manuscript. And uh, it's you know, from Kenneth McDuff. Hmm. And he, he complains in it that mm-hmm. he wanted to do the interview, but his lawyers had said no. But then, then you get a call from Addie McDuff. So then his mother called. She called the newsroom. You know, she was going to speak on his behalf. And the funny thing was she called early in the morning. Um, and, it, you know, I was um, working. I was anchoring uh, weekends. And so I was going in in the afternoons. And she called in the, in the early morning hours of that on a Saturday. And I got a call from the newsroom saying, you might want to come in. Uh, you just got a call from Addie McDuff. <laughs> she wants to talk to you. And if that doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will. Oh, my goodness. And I thought, okay, uh, yeah, I'm, I'll be there. And uh, I called her. I asked if we could, rec- first of all, I asked if I could go to Rosebud and, and do the interview in person. And she declined. Didn't want to do anything on camera. Um, but then you she. Had, you had nerve. <laughs> nerve and guts oh, yeah. at the time. My goodness. <laughs> yeah, because you know what? There was one of your colleagues had gone out there and the old man turned the Rottweilers loose on her. You remember that? Well, she could have set me up very easily. You know, yeah. she could have said absolutely and uh, had wow. the dogs at the ready. But. But she didn't. She, uh, for some reason, you know, said no, thank you. But, but uh, I'll, you can record the call, and so she did. So I've got your script, which I have not seen. I've got, I got a, a hold bit. of your script. I've got sources and newsrooms <laughs> everywhere. Um, but she, what you talk about is she firmly believes he is not the killer he's been made out to be, and blames his fate on the media. But here's a quote from her. He was a real loving kid. He was real loving. He was more loving than any of my other children. They wasn't as loving as he was. And when he was younger, he had girlfriends all the time. I don't know why you all are making such a big deal out of this. He didn't do it. But even if he did, these things happen worse than this every day. And it's no big deal. You remember that? I remember her defense. (laughs) I remember her argument that he couldn't have done it. This was just not something he was capable of doing. Um, I didn't remember the comparison with her other kids, mm-hmm. who I never had the pleasure of meeting. But then she retreats and says, but if he did do it, mm-hmm. it's did. not that bad. I mean, can but you if imagine? He did, so, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect with all reality there. Um, we went to their house. I wrote a search warrant. <clears throat> for the parents' house. And we went out there and she, uh, from inside the house, I didn't go in, but I was in the outside listening. And she one time loudly proclaimed, don't frame Junior like you did last time. That was her statement. Now, the, the dad um, don't quite know what, how he mustered up some thought, but he did. And he said, <laughs> We were in the, in the garage area, and he said, well, I don't know where he is. He was a fugitive at the time. But if you find him, you can kill him if you want to. It's cost me a lot of money. So the wonderful parents of Kenneth McDuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to wonder. I mean, you have to wonder. Uh, I don't think it's one or the other. I don't think it was solely, uh, you know, his parents' fault. I don't know that it was solely something missing. I think it was the perfect storm, you know, uh, that created the monster that he became. You know, whether it was some deficit of his own, um, you know, the n- lack of any nurturing uh, or his environment. But I mean, you look at that person, and 
I don't think his siblings committed similar crimes. They didn't. There was just something amiss. Um, but it was just one of those things. I mean, and I don't think it's unusual to have a family member, certainly a mother, in so many cases, um, tell a reporter, oh, that's, you're wrong. This, this could not have been mm -hmm. my child. That could never happen. This is absolutely, this person's been framed. And, and we've heard that so many times. And this is, a, this is, of course, after he's been convicted by juries in Tarrant County many yeah. years before for the brutal murder of three teenagers in Fort Worth, Texas. So this isn't our first uh, defense of him. And you would think maybe someone would get the idea that mm -hmm. the right. facts are just so strong that your, your son may well have done this. She was in, she was in his defense the entire time, even back then, of course. And in fact, the family tried to help hide evidence back then for the first three right. murders he did. And uh, Addie McDuff was on the bench in the area outside the courtroom in 1966. And to the top of her voice, is talking about how she's going to get those people who brought these charges and is threatening the families of his victims who were sitting out there, scared him to death. The sister of one of the victims didn't come back to court. She was so frightened. No, I mean, so clearly, you know, decades of. Well, you, we asked the question, did any good come out of it? If you remember, there were major legislative reforms called the McDuff laws. And do you remember how all that came about it, during governor Ann Richards and, Senator Ted Lyon leading the charge. Uh, you know, I do. Absolutely. I mean, recall sort of rectifying mm -hmm. the loopholes and the manners in which, you mm -hmm. know, allowed him to walk free the first time. Uh, absolutely. So you may recall, you know, I reported that it wasn't just loopholes. It was just out and out corruption of how he walked out. Do you remember your sense of, Wow or shock or it was more than that. It wasn't just a wow, that's how that happened. It was it was in, I felt infuriated and I felt a lack of trust in the criminal justice system mm -hmm. at that point in time. I mean it, if if how could there be a failure at that level to allow a lapse in justice and allow someone like a Kenneth McDuff to walk free? The governor, you know, at the time when McDuff was in, um, he declared uh, this federal judge has under a court order. Uh, you know, we have to pay fines and get in trouble if we population gets too high. The mm -hmm. prison population must be contained mm -hmm. at a certain number. And he told his underlings, you turn them out, whatever it takes, 150 a day at the time it was, turn them out. And they turned out every kind of creature mm -hmm. that walketh. And including many people who'd been on death row, but McDuff's was unique in many respects. Well, as you know, the uh, first season of this podcast is about the McDuff case, 17 episodes. And I suggest everybody go back and listen, but it's being spun into a, we're doing a television show and, and five part documentary that Bill and I are involved in. But it's interesting. The, I just recently interviewed, um, uh, James Collins, who was the head of the prison, Texas prison system, who is the prepared the list of all everybody been let off death row and paroled. And I only recently found out it was him that did it. And I'm the, I got the list and broke the big story that you know, all these guys were on there. But he says in the interview for the television show that they didn't need to drag the bottom of the barrel, as they said. They should, these guys should have never gotten out. There were plenty of other people. And Nobody so, cared. Yeah. But enough people with authority didn't care. It's maybe more precise. Um, the governor at the time was sort of a fiscal conservative. He didn't want to spend the taxpayers' mm -hmm. money building prisons. Mm -hmm. So what happened was the taxpayers were murdered by these people. And Texas, what Robert Riggs' work in exposing this um, led to the largest prison construction uh, time in, in the Western world's uh, existence. It, Texas prisons went from having a few to having them everywhere, all over Texas, because someone finally figured out, thanks to the, the one state senator and Robert's work, that this isn't worth it. I mean, you have to do whatever you can do to keep people safe. It's our highest duty. So they did. You know, one, the one thing that really got me, and I was a newcomer to the Capitol. I'd been covering the White House at all. It had 
come to Austin for a break. <laughs> Boy, that didn't work out. But uh, <laughs> um, so I break the story, and I'm doing all this reporting about irregularities in parole, and all of these death row former death row inmates have been paroled, and. Nobody, uh, Lion had hearings, but no one in the system said, where are they? Let's go look for them. And the unfortunate thing is literally seven months after I'm doing that first report, he's abducting mm -hmm. Colleen Reed. Now, many other women in between, but he's abducting her from blocks from the the state capitol where all these hearings have taken place. And like you said, on the justice system. Nobody said, hey, we've, we've got to go find these people. It's easier to just sort of ride the current yeah. tide is what they were doing. And they didn't want to spend money. They didn't want to create a big stir. Yeah. But somewhat quietly, people were dying and disappearing. Yeah. And uh, the consequence was quiet, but very bloody. Well, as a final word, what do you think the lesson of history is for today? The words that stick with me are too many people in authority didn't care. Hmm. Uh, and I, I, I think that's, you know, unfortunately something that it's a phrase that you can apply to any number of situations. I think when it comes to um, some of the issues and challenges that we, we face. And I think those situations um, can lead to one individual acting out that's right in mm -hmm. a way that is incredibly damaging mm -hmm. um murderous and uh you know evil quite frankly thank you for your work back mm -hmm. then I, you and i sort of knew each other from some other cases yeah. but thank you for your work back then and and um by talking about this i found at least that it is um helpful because we look back and say, you know, maybe we did some good, but also perhaps we can raise awareness that, yeah, bad things can happen if enough people don't care. And also in terms of personal safety, we need to know there are really mean people out there. And, you know, that's you don't want to scare people, but good grief. There are some really mean people that the only answer is to try to keep them away from us. Absolutely. So, but anyway, thank you for your work. Well, likewise. I mean, it's interesting to me that all these years later, um, before Macduff, our paths had intersected mm -hmm. for different reasons. Um, and and here we are, uh, you know, looking back at, at the one story that we all kind of can't seem to break. Well, you know, I, I do realize that we also intersected sort of as Macduff is going on, we all had to take a break uh, for the 51-day siege with the Branch Davidians. You were there. Well, if you look at the date on that letter from Macduff, you know, because to be honest, Robert, you know, when you asked me to, to pull it up, I was looking at this. February 18th, 1993. Oh, mm. It's coming. Right. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it was just days away. Ten days later. Yeah. And and so um, I remember wow. thinking, you know, this should have been a probably bigger deal. Mm -hmm. Why didn't it stay in my psyche? Why didn't it remain? Well, that's why. I mean, that's when he wrote it. I must have received it about it four or five days later. Mm -hmm. And then... Oh, mm. The next weekend, right. I was in Waco, and I was in Waco for 51 days. Right. And nothing was the same for any of us after any that Any of us one. after that. Yeah. Oh, boy. Not on that one. Not on that one. And then, you know, I, I had to kind of get it all back together and go back to the investigation on, into how yeah. he'd gotten out. And, yeah. God, that consumed my life for another four years or so. And uh, did I, I can't remember. Did you go to the execution? Did, you report there or were I you? was in Seattle by that time. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So no, did not. I do want our listeners to know that Rebecca was old school. <laughs> you get out and knock on doors, <laughs> you know, and probably, and had the tougher job of general assignment where you kind of start a day and you don't know how the day's going to end. Absolutely. I mean, that was really, the, that was, that's what I loved about it. I'll be really honest because, mm. you know, most of the jobs that I, I had in television, most of the stations I worked for, I was a weekend anchor, and three days a week I was a reporter, which meant general mm -hmm. assignments usually at night, and it usually meant you did not know. You could walk in the door at one o'clock in the afternoon, and you'd be, you know, have mm -hmm. a certain idea, a story that you'd pitch, and by three o'clock or four or five or nine, <laughs> it'd be so totally different. 
Uh, but I loved it. I mean, it was it's a one of a kind experience, to be honest. I remember telling my wife, yes, I swear I will be home for the soccer game tonight for the kids. And Luby's happens. Uh, you, know, you just never knew the Luby. The Luby's. Yeah, I was, I, I clean, was there. Texas. Yes, I was there. That was the one. That was a story that, you know, that we could. Yeah, we could spend some time talking that about that. Sort of too. Set, that was the perhaps the first. I don't know. First mass, mass shooting so by an individual. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I had friends that were at a. Uh, George Hennard. Yeah, George Hennard, who was a physician's son. Um, I had friends that were at a conference, law enforcement conference, very close to that when it started, and they ran over there from where they were. And a friend of ours peeked around the corner and shot the guy. Um, but had that law enforcement conference not been right. within very close, it would have been worse. But that also was the um, the basis uh, of Texas' interest in uh, right. concealed carry and all of that Absolutely. stuff. Because people felt like, that. in fact, the young lady whose parents, you mm -hmm. know her, yep. young lady whose parents were killed there, became a member of the Texas legislature mm -hmm. and uh, pushed the idea that had one citizen in there, you know, had a gun, they could have stopped it. But, and that's, you know, discussed every day in a million different right. ways up yeah. and down. But yeah. What a deal. That, wow. was, that was the genesis of that. You had an interesting job. Your objective. That's what I remember about you. Well, th well thank <laughs> you for that. I, you I, bet. I appreciate that. <laughs> kind words. Well, Rebecca, thank you for your objectivity <laughs> and your great work and sitting down here with us today. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having yep. me. Yep. We want to be your favorite true crime podcast. So please recommend us to your friends and leave a review wherever you listen. If you want to receive updates and bonus interviews, join our true crime community at truecrimereporter.com. If you have suggestions or know of a case that we should look into, email us at fan at truecrimereporter.com. This podcast is a trademarked and copyrighted news organization based in Dallas, Texas. You can read more about our news team at truecrimereporter.com. Thanks for listening to our journey into darkness.